Meeting seven o'clock. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bosmas. Here. Commissioner Bauer. Here. Commissioner Gage. Here. Commissioner Gary. Here. Commissioner Lynn. Here. Commissioner Ostra. Here. Commissioner Cordy. Here. Okay, we're all here. Uh, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you very much. Just a uh, little order, uh, point of order here. We, uh, If you have a cell phone, if you'd like to put that on vibrate or turn it off, uh, we would appreciate it. We have a couple of... Uh, awards uh, that we would like to present tonight and uh, city manager is at the podium and I'll join him over there. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good evening, mayor, commissioners, guests, and community. Tonight we have the pleasure of providing three awards of distinction. These awards recognize those community members and individuals who substantially contribute to the quality of life within the community through sustained efforts. The term community itself is defined by the Webster Merriam Dictionary as a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. The individuals and entities to be recognized tonight have fostered such fellowship through their efforts and their dedication. Indeed, the efforts of these individuals have strengthened the entire community and we are grateful for their contributions. Their hard work is reflective of the Sault Ste. Marie spirit of resiliency, communal support, passion, and a tireless work ethic. There are three distinct awards as mentioned. Uh, the first is the Augusta Hersley Seal Award for the Island Trail Committee. And uh, at this time, I would like to invite any members or representatives with the Island Trail Committee to join us up front here tonight. <laughs> Uh, just some remarks about the Island Trail Committee. During 2016, the Island Trail Committee was an active and driving force in the development of Voyager Island, Heron Island, and surrounding areas. The total contributions for these activities approached $90,000 near the end of September 2016 with donations of money, equipment, and supplies, as well as 1,700 volunteer labor hours. The completed activities include the clearing of over one mile of hiking trails, the installation of a compost toilet, a boardwalk, and a wildlife birding observation platform, as well as the stockpiling of old building materials and the construction of docking facilities. Major participants and members of the Island Trail Committee included the EUP Regional Planning and Development Commission, the Building a Healthier Community Coalition, the Sioux Tribe Partnerships to Improve Community Health Project, the Chippewa County Community Foundation, the Great Lakes Endowment Fund, the Sault Ste. Marie Rotary Club and Sunrise Rotary Club, and the Robert P. and Ella B. Hudson Foundation. The major donors included Sioux Area Public Schools Construction Welding Classes, National Office Products, Seward's Woods and Craft Wordworking and phot Photography, Smith Sanitation, Waste Management, as well as Bird's Eye Outfitters. Other volunteers, and this is a fairly lengthy list which speaks to the energy behind this project, Jim Ademo, Tom Allen, John Asquith, Bernie Arbick, Bill Batchelor, Joanne Berry, Wayne Berry, Phil Becker, Jeff Beeling, Ellen Benoit, Terry Benoit, Josh Billington, Ron Blair, Sherry Brooks, Tom Brown, Dave Bush, Sally Childs, Jock Clark, Lynn Coburn, Art Cooper, Larry Cooper, Perry Cooper, Ken Demeray, Christina Dennison, Ann Doherty, Denny Doherty, Mary Ann Doherty, Craig Flickinger, Kelly Freeman, Sandy Gallagher, Tony Holler, Heather Hemming, Mary Ellen Hemming, Jim Hill, Linda Hoth, Ken and Wilda Hopper, Gary Horner, Lois Horner, Mark Horner, Scott Horner, Julie John, Jennifer John, Marla John, Norm John, Debbie Jones, Steve Jones, we're through J, Paul Kelso, <laughs> <laughs> Justin Nepper, Martin Corson, Rocky Krager, Chuck Crutch, Carrie Kimes, Nicole Labes, Lois Leighton, Ron Lamar, Jeff Lozen, 
Lindsay Maynard, Josh McDonald, Clint McKenzie, Jennifer Mitten, Elliot Nelson, Sabrina Nevue, Catherine O'Donnell, Dave Paradise, Tom Pink, John Riley, Norris Seward, Tracy Seward, Wayne Solmes, Hannah Sova, Nancy Walker, Ted Walker, Eric Wadeski, Pete Williamson, and Jerry Wilson. We are grateful for the efforts of these organizations and the plaque, if it's uh, pulled up. Yep, that's the uh, plaque that's bolted to the wall downstairs, and we weren't able to bring it here tonight because of that, but we're happy to show it. We're grateful for the efforts of these organizations, donors, and volunteers who have so diligently and comprehensively worked to improve the parks and recreation system of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, and in doing so have strengthened recreational tourism within and for the community and elevated the quality of life for the citizens of the city of Sault Ste. Marie. At this time, we're pleased to recognize the Island Trail Committee with the Augusta Hersley Seal Award for 2016. Thank you. And just, uh, just a note of housekeeping after the three awards, I uh, would invite the members and representatives of the Island Trail Committee to uh, join Parks and Recreation Director Dan Wires downstairs for a picture in front of the plaque. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second award that I'm pleased to present tonight is the Edna Young's Award. If uh, Becky Bottrell could please step forward. Throughout her tenure of employment with the City of Sault Ste. Marie and the Sault Ste. Marie Economic Development Corporation, Becky Bottrell served as a passionate advocate for beautification efforts and programming. Specifically, Becky contributed to the launching and sustaining of the annual citywide cleanup, helping to remove thousands and thousands of tons of debris and litter from the city each spring and engaging members of the public in the beauty of Sault Ste. Marie. These efforts continue today as the city approaches its 22nd annual citywide cleanup. Certainly many volunteers in this effort finally remember Becky's organization of and passion for the event. Becky has also contributed to many other beautification efforts throughout the city, including the improvement of the business spur, the support of part-time beautification employees, participation in various beautification committees, the procurement of recycling bins and other amenities, and many other activities, programs, and improvements. Becky also served for many years in different leadership capacities with Keep Michigan Beautiful and Keep America Beautiful. The Edna Young's Award was originally established by the former City Beautification Committee to be given annually in memory of Edna Young's for outstanding contributions toward city beautification. Ms. Young's had been active in the Sioux Garden Club for many years and by her own example promoted a sense of pride in the appearance of the community. When Ms. Young's passed away in 1988, the funds donated in her memory were used to establish the Edna Young's Award, which is intended to recognize an individual or organization that has made outstanding contributions to improving the appearance of the city and inspiring community pride. Becky Bottrell has certainly made such outstanding contributions, and we congratulate her and are pleased to present to her the Edna Young's Award for 2016. great honor to receive this award. I knew Edna Young's as a young girl. Like The city manager said she passed away in 1988 before I began working for the city. Um, she was a wonderful lady and she did. The slogan, the beauty of the Sioux depends on you that many people often hear me quote over and over again what originated with her. And it's a great honor to receive this award in one that um, my great mentor, Bud Weber, once received his names on here in 1993. So it means a lot to me to have my name associated with both of their names on this award. So thank you for everybody that took the time to vote. And appreciate it. The third award that we're very pleased to present tonight 
is the WFG Bud Weber Citizenship Award. If Mr. Denny Doherty could please step forward. Mr. Denny Doherty has been a leader in our community through his volunteer efforts, his commitment to outdoor recreation facilities and activities, and his ability to surround himself with like-minded citizens with the high energy necessary to make an impact and significance in our city parks and recreation system. Beginning in 1992, Denny and his volunteer base formed Project Park, which up to 2006 raised over $500,000 in revenues and volunteer hours. The funding raised came from 49 local businesses, 30 organizations, and 215 community volunteers. Five phases of work completed at the Minneapolis Woods, now Sioux Seal Recreation Area, demonstrated their commitment to our community. Improvements included the clearing of brush as well as the seeding and mulching of the ski hill, tubing hill, and hiking trail areas, and general vicinity and construction work in the area. Also, the group installed ski and tubing lift systems, fencing, and area signage. Beginning in 2006, Project Park set its sight on the development and opening up of over 6,500 feet of all-season trails, now named the William Lynn Trails. Over $155,000 in revenues and volunteer hours was fundraised from 2001 to 2006 for this project. Project Park, under Denny's leadership beginning in 2016, developed with many community partners uh, with the Lower River Islands project. The construction of a remote canoe and kayak launch on the island and at Charles T. Harvey Marina, pathway construction, composting restrooms, and a viewing deck provided a new recreational opportunity on the newly named Voyager Island Park. In 2017, additional development will include a canoe and kayak launch on Rotary Island Park and Heron Island, as well as additional development of a trail network. Furthermore, beginning in 2016, over 16,000 in revenues and volunteer hours was raised to construct a 25-foot bridge and an additional pathway of 800 feet to open up the West Trail at the William Lynn Trails at the Sioux Seal Recreational Area. In 2017, there is a plan to surface 1,800 feet of pathway that will connect city property with school property. This project is expected to raise over $29,500. Mr. Denny Doherty has over an extended period of time and through sustained volunteer efforts and participation on city committees and community organizations made outstanding and long-lasting contributions to the community resulting in the betterment of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, its citizens, and the entire region. We are pleased to present to him the WFG Bud Weber Citizenship Award for 2016. Robin, she's the most important one. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
Just want to say thank you for all your efforts to put this together and um, a real big thank you to all the donors over the years and the volunteers over 300 we've been working with and um, it's just been a privilege uh, but of course I share this uh, oh, I only have half the word uh, my wife Marianne mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, without her, I wouldn't be here so yeah, thank you very much okay. On, certainly on behalf of the uh, commission and the community, again, thank uh, those award winners. Uh, you make Sioux St. Marie what it is, no question. And uh, it's been a long time since we've uh, presented those awards, but it takes a years of accumulation and without a doubt, uh, they're very deserving and not, we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to uh, item number four, which is the public comment on scheduled agenda items. Any person may reserve time to speak on an agenda item, uh, not to exceed three minutes per person. Is there anyone in the audience that would want to speak, speak on an agenda item? Okay, here now we'll move on to... Um, no, they're just going down to get a picture. <laughs> and then, maybe they're going to get <laughs> Item number, yes, Denny, Denny will be back. Uh, item number five is the consent agenda. Uh, Deputy City Manager, Toyer. Under the consent agenda, a minute approval. One, approval of the minutes of the regular City Commission meeting of February 20th, 2017. Recommended action is to approve the minutes of the regular City Commission meeting of February 20th, 2017. Item two, acceptance of the minutes of the following boards and commissions. A, Community Services Board of January 31st. B, Sault Ste. Marie Housing Commission of January 19th. Recommended action is to accept the minutes of the various boards and commissions. Item B, Communications. One, from the Historical Development Commission. Allocation of Osborne Trust Funds for the Kent Marie uh, Museum Kiosk. Recommended action is to approve an appropriation of up to $735 of Osborne Trust Funds to the Chippewa County Historical Society toward the cost of the Kemp Industrial Museum Kiosk. Item C, City Manager's Report. One, authorization of a contract with Centerpoint Energy for the purchase of natural gas. Recommended action, authorize the city manager to execute a Michigan gas customer choice contract with Centerpoint Energy Incorporated of Minneapolis, Minnesota for a term of 24 months with a 24 month renewal option as mutually agreed upon. Item two under city manager's report is appropriation of funding for an emergency repair of motor grader. Recommended action is accept this expenditure of 11,000 $828.84 from the Stock and Equipment Fund by City Administration to cover the cost of the emergency repair to the John Deere Motor Grader and ratify this action. Item 3 under City Manager's report is approval of an interlocal agreement to cross uh, jurisdictional boundaries entered into by signing the Participating Upper Peninsula Transportation Providers Agreement. Recommended action is to authorize the Mayor to execute the included agreement. Okay, thank you. Is there a commissioner that would like something further explained on the consent agenda? If not, uh, Commissioner Twarty. Thank you. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Support. Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Osterhout? Yes. Commissioner Twarty? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item six, special orders of business. A, public hearing on the renewal of the principal shopping district. Thank you, uh, City Manager Turner. Thank you, Mayor. On this matter, DDA Director Nepper is uh, planning to present to the City Commission and community. Okay. Evening, Justin. Evening, Mayor and Commissioners. <coughs> We're in our uh, final um, kind of item to wrap up the public hearings for the principal shopping district. I think it's our third uh, five-year renewal that the city is commi commission is considering. Uh, again, it's about a, approximately a $28,000 uh, amount total across the downtown development authority district uh, that would be assessed uh, 
based on a two mil special assessment on the taxable properties uh, downtown. And this goes towards operating uh, marketing promotions for the downtown budget. Um, we've uh, notified all property owners. We sent out two different letters. Uh, and uh, so far, I think we've only had one uh, property owner here uh, in support of the of the event. Uh, I'm sorry, in support of the renewal and nobody opposed. So um, I would uh, suggest that we move forward with the with the public hearing. Okay, any questions of Justin? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, city manager, anything else? Uh, just a note of clarification that there are two actions. <clears throat> the first recommendation is to hold a scheduled public hearing, and the second is to adopt the included resolution on the confirmation of the role. Thank okay, you. thank you. And at this time, we'll hold the public hearing on the renewal of the principal shopping district as explained. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to make a comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to the uh, City Commission. Uh, Commissioner Bauer. I would like to say, though, for the record, that as a uh, property owner in that district, I do support the principal shopping district renewal. And I have the other two times that yes. we voted on this in the past. So um, I would vote that we, or I would move, excuse me, that we uh, continue with the principal shopping district for another five years. Support. So move supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Ostro? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item B, under special orders of business, is second reading of an ordinance to create non-residential fencing regulations. A is public comments and B is action on the ordinance. Thank you. City Manager? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on this matter, Community Development Director Freeman is planning to present. Um, just to note that there's one recommendation in the agenda. However, there are actually two recommended actions. The first, to hold the public hearing on public comments, to receive public comments, and the second, to uh, for the commission to take action on the item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Evening, Kelly. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, so every so often, a large project uh, comes along and it reveals uh, holes or places that need adjustment in your ordinance, and Meyer has done that favor for us uh, with this. Uh, so, within the zoning ordinance, uh, section 1712 uh, regulates residential fences, walls, and protective barriers, but there's nothing that regulates those in commercial or industrial settings. Um, what had been done previously has been to take the residential settings and apply those regulations to commercial and industrial properties, and they didn't always fit, and it's kind of a not best practice to try to fit a square peg in a round hole. So uh, after it came to light, I raised the issue with the Planning Commission and um, working with them, uh, we've created special districts for, or special regulations for commercial districts, uh, which includes office service B123 and tourist, as well as industrial situations in the I-12 and marine services districts. So this is what we've got on the books right now for residential. This isn't changing, this is just kind of background information. Um, Right now, the way that the regulations work, you see the front yard in green, and in those areas, you're limited to four feet in height with a maximum of 70% solid construction. Uh, the blue is the rear where you can do six feet and 100% solid. On corner lots like you see here, um, if you're within 20 feet of the corner, um, you can have a fence, but only if your uh, building is closer. It's the, the uh, 20 feet or wherever your building line is, whichever is less. So if your house is 15, you can have the fence at 15, but your house is at 25, you can have your fence at 20. Uh, additionally, the residential requirements uh, put in place things dealing with visibility triangles, encroachments. Uh, obviously, you can't have barbed wire, electric fence in residential <coughs> zoning districts. Uh, it also provides how fence height is measured. So for the proposed commercial districts, it's actually fairly similar to the residential ones. Uh, same front yard height and rear yard height, same 70% uh, uh, solid max in the front yard, 100% in the back. Uh, but what we've proposed is to move away from the corner side setback and instead have a five foot uh, setback from any improved street or alley. That just makes things a little bit more easy to administer. 
additionally, the commercial regulations would permit up to a full six foot perimeter fence if you have like a construction site or a demolition site, or if you have like undeveloped land or uh, a property that otherwise has hazardous conditions. Uh, additionally, it would provide up to eight feet uh, for accessory seasonal outdoor or semi-outdoor retail spaces. This is the Meyer Garden Center fence that kind of triggered this all. They wanted to have an eight foot fence along two sides of it and the max in residential is six, so that's where this whole thing kind of came from. Um, additionally, it uses the same visibility triangle right away encroachment and uh, measurements uh, scheme as the residential section. Uh, barbed wire uh, is permitted largely only in B3. There are some exceptions which we'll get into in the next slide. Uh, these provisions basically standard or cover your standard barbed wire installation, three strands horizontally, um, no razor wire, concertina wire, nothing that'll cut somebody. Um, fairly standard stuff. Uh, outside of the B3, but still in the commercial districts and office service B1, B2, um, barbed wire is allowed when you're protecting critical infrastructure sites like substations or water towers, lift stations, et cetera, et cetera, but subject to the same regulations in the last slide. Uh, for industrial, um, the big changes are that you can do 100% solid front and rear, and your front goes up to six feet and your rear up to eight feet. Uh, again, it's the same five foot setback from an improved street or alley. Uh, just as with the last one, you can do a six-foot full perimeter fence into those circumstances. The garden center um, uh, type fencing, as well as up to 10 feet, and this is one that's specific to industrial, up to 10 feet high to uh, secure open outdoor storage area, but you've got to have that 10 feet from the property line to go up to 10, otherwise it's limited to 8. That'll keep a 10-foot fence from going right on the property line. And we have a lot of areas in town where you have industrial and residential close up. So I wanted to make sure that if somebody wanted to do that, it was well enough away from the residential property line that it wouldn't create a big issue. Uh, again, same thing with the visibility triangle encroachments and measurement electrification and so on and so forth. Um, barbed wire be permitted in all these districts, same standards as before. Um, just a little bit of a timeline. This actually uh, came up uh, to the Planning Commission back in October, uh, dealt with this at both the December and January 26 meetings where they held uh, on January 26 the public, uh, public hearing. There was no commentary uh, received throughout any of this starting from October to present.
and they made a recommendation unanimously to approve the ordinance as presented. Okay, any questions of Kelly, uh, Commissioner Twardy? Thank you. Um, just, so how is this going to affect properties that are already not using these zoning requirements? So per the um, Zoning Enabling Act, anybody who is not out of compliance with the regulations is allowed to keep what they have. But if they remove it or make any modifications to it in the future, it has to be consistent with the regulations. Okay. So yes. they're grandfathered in, basically. They are grand, because I guess what I was specifically thinking about was the power canal walkway, and how would that affect any sort of new fencing that they might? Certainly, we'll work with them, and that's a unique enough uh, situation that, if necessary, that can be addressed by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. All right, thank if you. what they come up with doesn't already fit into yeah, this Because I think right now they have some fairly serious razor blade barbed wire, don't they, at the yeah, top of I think it's fairly their... low in some sections yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Any thank other you. questions? Uh, Commissioner Gage. Following up on Commissioner Twardy's questions, <clears throat> um, is there any specific reason why we wouldn't be able to necessarily ban them from using barbed wire along that? Uh, when you draft regulations, you want to make sure that they will apply equally to everybody with, within the city, so you, you can't necessarily single out a particular property owner or a situation like that. Um, but but you just got to make it as palatable as you can for... But who wanted to remove barbed wire in this whole city? Certainly. Okay. That's, the, that's at Anyone your discretion. Else? Commissioner Bauer. So, um, other than Meyer, though, do you know of anyone who would be immediately and directly affected by this, or is this just, you know, basically? It's fixing a problem before it becomes a bigger right. one. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Manager, any further? Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. Just appreciate Mr. Freeman's work on this, as well as the Planning Commission's uh, time spent reviewing <clears throat> this ordinance, as well as the uh, ordinances from peer communities which were uh, used in reference for the preparation of this ordinance. Okay, Okay. thank you. And there are two items. Uh, one will be the uh, public uh, comment and then the action on the agenda item. So at this time, we will hold a uh, public comment on the ordinance to create non-residential fencing regulations. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to make a comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, we will go to the City Commission. Uh, Commissioner Gage. Um, I so move that the Commission adopt the ordinance as presented. Support. It's been moved and supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gage. Yes. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Commissioner Lynn. Yes. Commissioner Ostro. Yes. Commissioner Twardy. Yes. Mayor Bospis. Yes. Commissioner Bauer. Yes. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. Item C under special orders of business is first reading of a payment in lieu of taxes ordinance for a proposed development by the WOTA Group Incorporated. Okay, thank you. Uh, city Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As commissioners are aware, the city of Sault Ste. Marie has recently been approached by the WOTA Group about a proposed development within the Maloney's Alley vicinity. More specifically, the WOTA Group is proposing the construction of a 65 unit multifamily development situated near the corner of Maloney Alley and Osborne Boulevard. This development would be manifested through the construction of a four-story residential building on the current footprint of the 4,000 square foot warehouse, the former Claremont Trucking Building, <coughs> and its surrounding parking area. The WOTA Group is also proposing a large community room for the benefit of any tenants and their guests, as well as at least 2,000 to 3,240 square feet of office and retail space which would be available for rent at market rate. Per the included communication, the WOTA Group is formally requesting that a payment in lieu of taxes arrangement in support of this development be approved by the City Commission. As indicated by the WOTA Group, this pilot arrangement would aid in ensuring the long-term financial stability of the property and would assist the developer in its efforts to receive funding from MISHTA for the project. The WOTA Group is projecting that the total cost of the development would exceed $9 million. As commissioners are aware, a pilot arrangement allows for a development to provide a specified percentage of the affordable rate rents less common utilities to taxing jurisdictions in lieu of a traditional tax bill. Such revenues are then distributed to various taxing jurisdictions on a basis that's proportionate to their respective share of the aggregate millages. The Water Group has also expressed a willingness to execute with the City of Sault Ste. Marie 
a municipal services agreement that would pay the city annually an amount of $15,500 in addition to the revenues the city would receive through the pilot arrangement. The municipal services agreement would provide for the amount of $15,500 to be increased each year per the published consumer price increase index, excuse me, as long as said increase does not exceed 3%. A draft pilot ordinance has been included for review and consideration by the City Commission, which would include a payment in lieu of taxes estimated on a proposed 3% of net shelter rents being remitted to the various taxing units and would further provide for the service charge provided for within the ordinance to include an amount equal to what the ad valorem taxes would be on the commercial portion of the development had it been taxed separately. This ordinance was originally drafted by City Attorney Canelo and in discussion, discussing the ordinance and its provisions with MISHTA, uh, there is a updated ordinance from what is in the packet in front of the commission tonight. Uh, there are some minor language changes, but nothing of, uh, of significance as compared to the existing ordinance in the packet. It is projected that the total initial financial benefit to the city from this development would be just over $28,000 annually. Please note this is a very tentative and preliminary figure subject to change at this time. The conceptual site plan has been included for further review by the City Commission and community. Aside from any approvals on the pilot arrangement request, additional approvals from the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals would be needed for the formal site plan and a numerical variance on allowable floor space for residential and commercial uses of the development, respectively. Additionally, it should be noted that the subject parcel upon which this development would occur currently has an active obsolete property rehabilitation act exemption certificate in place which was previously granted by the city commission in 2009 for a proposed development for medical office buildings this incentive which became effective on december 31st 2009 should be repealed if it is the will of the city commission for the project at hand to proceed in order to prevent any contradictions between the oprah incentive and the specific development Accordingly, it's my recommendation that the City Commission should take the three following actions if it wishes to proceed with the development. First, approve a first reading of the included ordinance, the presented ordinance rather, and schedule the consideration of a second reading of the ordinance and the potential adoption of the same at the regular City Commission meeting scheduled to take place on March 20th. Secondarily, schedule a public hearing on the included ordinance to be held during the March 20th regular meeting of the City Commission prior to consideration and potential adoption of the ordinance. And thirdly, schedule a public hearing on the repeal of the Obsolete Property Rehabilitation Act incentive for the subject property as detailed for the March 20th regular meeting of the City Commission. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you, City Manager. Uh, comments? Uh, I know, uh, Commissioner, uh, we have a gentleman here, too, from the Water Group, uh, Craig Patterson. Uh, thank you. Um, but uh, I know Commissioner Gary wanted to say a few words. Uh, uh, can I wait till the end? Near the end, sure. Craig, would you like to come to the sure. microphone? Please. Sure. Uh, Mayor, thank you for the opportunity. Commission, Craig Patterson. I'm the Senior Vice President for the Water Group. It's been, I think, about six years ago that I came before this chamber. Um, it's been a while. Been uh, we're the owners of Wood Creek Manor, the senior property up on Meridian, as you may remember. We totally rehabbed that in 2013. We cut the ribbon, uh, and it's been a highly successful property for us. This council, this commission uh, back then gave us a pilot so that we could score appropriately to win the funding from Mishta at the time. Since then, on and off, uh, we have been looking in Sault Ste. Marie downtown to find the right site. And it was back last fall, probably November, that we got very serious about the site at 146 Ridge. Um, we met with city, I met mayor again, and we talked about this, the probability of going forward. And um, as you can see, um, let me make sure, are we on? There we are. <coughs> Whoops, I backed up, let me back up. This is the building that already exists on site, the warehouse that was described. Uh, we have already been in the building a couple times. In fact, we had an environmental consultant there just in the last week to take a look at it. Uh, you know the site, you know it was there. 
What we plan to do is um, go ahead as described and build a four-story new construction, level this, and have 65 units, which would, 63 of the units would be low to moderate income housing like what is up at uh, Wood Creek, both Wood Creeks, by the way, side by side, one owned by the Worth family, we own the senior deal. Um, what we would do, but two of the units in this particular property that we propose would be market rate. Those two two bedroom market rate units would yield what we think would be somewhere between 800 to $875 for rent, and they would be open to anybody who could qualify to pay the rent. The rest of the units would be restricted rents, typical of Mishta properties. Since we were here uh, back in 2010 through 2013, uh, we have been successful throughout the Upper Peninsula with several projects. And why I wanted to show you the Lloyd House of Menominee is because the Lloyd House of Menominee was the adaptive reuse of a property downtown in which we put 43 units that were light tech, low to moderate income, and two units were market rate. And if you look to the right of the marquee, um, that is commercial space that we developed blended in with the market rates, blended in with the, um, the light tech units or the MISHTA funded units. The compatibility of light tech, commercial, uh, and market rate has been a windfall for the community uh, for Menominee. This building was falling apart and it sat there vacant for probably 10 years. It used to be a manufacturing assembly for a called f and um, and uh, it was the f and building. They made soccer netting and fish netting, etc. cetera. Uh, this property was so successful that we received the governor's award for the property. This is the way it looks today. Uh, we invested over 10 million through light tech funding. This is similar to what would happen at uh, this particular property down the street, which we are, we have named Osborne Commons uh, to immortalize the memory of your governor that came from this city. Um, this is just Governor Snyder at the ribbon cutting. And, um, but to move forward, excuse me. Oh, just to show you the quality of some of the units we had. And the reason I put this in, this is, a, this is a low to moderate income housing unit that was funded through the MISHTA funding. But as you can see, the views of the marina, the views of the water toward the locks, toward Lake Superior, et cetera, would be similar as we would build Osborne Commons. And um, both market rate and light tech unit residents would enjoy that. This is an example of community space that is in Lloyd House, but it would also be similar type of quality in the community space, the thousand plus square feet that will be on the ground level facing Osborne Boulevard. And let's see. That's us. That's it? The plans are... There's more picture. Thank you. <clears throat> so as you can see, this is the site rendering of how the building will lay out. Um, most of the parking is to the east, behind the bank. Um, we will have um, on the facing Osborne and on the Maloney Alley will be the commercial pod. Uh, and then you can see to the south of the commercial pod you'll see the landscape area that will be there and um, will be for the enjoyment of tenants and their guests. It'll also make a nice green buffer uh, toward the south and toward the laundry mat. We have talked about the possibility of future development on a phase two that could include 
the rest of that corner of Ridge and Osborne. But that is to come in the future if we can line up things in the appropriate way. But first and foremost, in order to get funding of what um, um, Oliver spoke, Mr. Turner spoke to us, nine million, our new performa for the total development <coughs> is roughly 11.9 million investment. Um, let me continue. So that is the site plan, and um, tonight I am here to answer any questions about the pilot request. Uh, 63 units will be for low to moderate income. We like to talk about the working families, seniors, and singles that could possibly go into this property. There are individuals that could uh, earn anywhere from minimum wage up to $17 an hour. Uh, we would manage the property ourselves with WOTA management. Um, the WOTA management group has a very stringent way of, of uh, actually vetting every tenant that comes in. Uh, we have to abide by fair housing. That's the way all of us do in the rental business uh, to make sure we do not discriminate, but we can look at the ability of a tenant, a potential tenant, tenant to pay the rent. Um, without the pilot, we will not be able to score high enough in the upcoming Mishta round, which commences on April 3rd, meaning we have to turn in our application on April 3rd, we would not be able to get enough points in order to win the funding. Um, there are a couple other steps that we must go through. Um, as mentioned, we still have to get a, a site plan approval and also there is a zoning change which is uh, for a, um, a scheduling with the ZBA that's forthcoming this month. With that, I can answer any questions. Okay, uh, thanks. And I, I, maybe I'll just start the discussion now and then uh, ask the commission to, to chime in a bit. But um, hard to believe it's been six years <laughs> to, that, that we actually met. But um, first of all, I'd thank you for you know being diligent in moving toward uh, at least housing in the additional housing in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. And that, that's important. This, this may be the first uh, entity that uh, embarks on Maloney's Alley. I know it's been a... Um, um, it's been a lot of effort put in by a number of people, including the commission, on, on trying to get uh, a footprint, uh, some kind of a, a structure in that area. I think when we talked initially and since then, uh, the commission has talked about with, with you and with the city manager about market rate units. About uh, We talked uh, at length and had a study um, uh, several years ago about the importance of market rate units in our community and that we had have had a number of affordable units out there um, and maybe that we were at the extent that we had enough and we would look to the market rate entity um, and at that time you made sort of a, uh, a commitment that we would look at maybe 10 units in that um, development now we're down to two um, and I can't stress enough that um, market rate units are a real need in this community uh, not that the uh, low to mod uh, could be as important, but we have, looks like, um, uh, units available. I, I don't know if uh, I, I've done, done any study to see if they're all rented that are available in the community at this point. But um, when I was part of the development in Avery Square, uh, which was a downtown location with senior location, we have 28 um, at that, and st I believe we still have 28 market rate units in the Avery Square complex of 57 units. Um, so there's 29 loan mod and 28 market rate. Um, I would like to see the WOTA group put some real effort because I think two, in my mind, um, is a token. I mean, I, um, I know what the developer fee was for Avery Square, and we gave that as a community action. Uh, they gave that back to the development, which caused those departments to be bigger than normal. Um, and all that money, 620 some thousand dollars, went back into those units and made those apartments even more substantial. So I know what you're dealing with as far as what might be available. And 
And I, though that's public record, I'm, I'm sure you share that with us what the developer fee is for that, which goes in your pocket for the most part. But I'm, I'm asking at this point the Wilder Group to, to take a look at more than two units. Um, when you look at the, the, that area, um, it's not, I think, what the commission was looking for as a, uh, uh, and, I, and I don't want to say that the development is not good because when you see that uh, development in uh, Menominee, Tremendous, um, the, the pictures and uh, and what you've been able to do there. How many affordable housing units are in a in Menominee, uh, in that, including that one now? Were you the first, or were there many? Well, um, there were other um, affordable units. In fact, there's a uh, a large 80 unit HUD, totally Section 8, all okay. voucher, that was there and existing. There are several other affordable. Don, I think you've got some uh, RD properties like the one we, we own up on Meridian and the one next door. Um, this is a very tight deal financially. When we spoke, it was before the president got elected. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, <coughs> the equity prices that we were running our pro formas on, what we expected to get from the investors was much higher than it is now. Yeah. Uh, what's happening is the equity market is eroded in anticipation that uh, there's going to be a lowering of the corporate tax rate. So what we've been is through several variations of this theme trying to, and I had to fight to get two market rates. And it's, when you say token, I understand your position, but it was my, well, <laughs> I don't want to go there, but I mean, there was some significant pushback. Um, because the deferred developer fee in order to get two rose significantly, uh, which means there's less developer fee. But the other part of this, there's only so much developer fee we can defer in order. Uh, excuse, excuse me, Greg, could you move the mic at least closer to you so the, sure. the, the, this is for the people at home okay. that are listening? Okay. So what I was saying was the developer fee, um, there's, there's two portions of developer fee. If, if you get 100% developer fee, that's great. That's the ideal situation. In order to put in the two market rate units with the eroded credit price, we had to defer a larger portion of the developer fee than normal. And we're very close to a point where it then, we're, we're getting to a point because of the, just those two and other costs. See, the other part of this that we don't get any light tech, no, we get nothing from Mishta is the fact we're putting in commercial. Oh, we, yeah, we, and we, community action did the same. Yes. You know, and that was a $12 million project. So, so, you, you, yeah. so you understand how this works. Yeah. And, yeah. and so what I have said to, to your staff, who, by the way, has been very good at fee, giving feedback from commission, et cetera, I've said, we want to put as many as we can, but right now, with the way the, the credit prices are, this is what we can do to make the deal work. And we understand the commission may push back and say, then we don't want to give you a pile. We understand that. So. Okay. Um, I appreciate those, those comments, and, and, and it's, a, it's a great development. Um, and, and we thank you for the diligence in bringing something like that to the community. And it's an, you know, 11 million versus nine, that we, you know, because of the, the price has gone up, you're saying? Well, the, because the credit price has gone down. When we first underwrote this, I think it was up at 98, 99. Now we're down to 91, 92. Okay. And that isn't even certain. Okay. But it's that drop that got me from a 10%. That was what I always wanted to do was 10% or more which would have been seven or more units, uh, but, but because we could score extra points and because it met the needs. Um, this is an ideal community put, put market rate in if you can get the funding for the market rate. I might mention that part of our sourcing here is we're carrying perm debt on this. It's not just light tech. We gotta carry perm debt and we're getting a 538 We've got to put into our pro forma an RD-538 loan to help that um, be done. So okay. um, we, um, what we did do was we, um, at 
at the request, we did change the MSA, which I think everybody understands how the municipal service agreements work to bring more cash into the community directly as opposed to a, a general pilot. Um, if for some reason the Hill could make a decision on corporate taxes and, you know, in the near term, then that would stabilize and maybe the equity prices would go up. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Commissioner Torty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do know that the Lloyd Project, there was a huge need for low to mod subsidized housing over in Menominee. And I, I don't feel that we really fit so much into that category because I, I can tell you I own a small business and I pay my three employees to the high upper echelon of where you're talking about that people would qualify to live here and they don't really go out for coffee very much. They don't go out to eat. Those are very, those are things that people who can pay for market rent and I don't think that downtown, in our downtown area, we don't need more low to moderate income. I think that we need more market rate housing down there. We're trying to bring people in down to the downtown area that can afford to go out for a $4 cup of coffee or that are going to shop at the health food store or go out for a $5 beer or even shop at a high end, you know, end clothing $4 store. Be getting a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, they're not buying Patagonia clothing and North Face clothing and, and stuff like that. Not that we're trying to lock them out of our downtown area. Don't get me wrong, and I know that you guys do great projects. You really do. But the need, my sister runs 28 subsidized housing communities in the, in the UP, and what we need in Sault Ste. Marie, she gets at least five phone calls a week, sometimes three or four a day looking for market rate, and she's not completely full. So she has open units up at Bridge Village that are sitting there that there's nobody to live in them. So I, I'm, I'm not, I think, I would love, really love for you to go back to the drawing board, like the mayor said, and come back to us with more market rate. That's what we need downtown. Uh, Commissioner Geary. I have uh, a disclosure, I guess, and a disclaimer. Uh, as Craig mentioned, I work for USDA Rural Development. We have a multifamily housing program. And in our portfolio, we have 67 properties with almost 2,000 units in uh, 18 county service area. WOTA is a customer of ours with seven properties, which is about 10% of our base. Um, I don't personally approve their loans. They go to the national office. Uh, I spoke to the attorney, city attorney, excuse me, uh, and I will not have any involvement with this proposed project. And what he just mentioned was possible guarantee by rural development of bank financing or different financing, so we wouldn't be directly involved. So I would want to request uh, Steve's opinion again as to my uh, involvement. Uh, I'd like to not abstain and, and uh, give my opinion and go forward. In my opinion, uh, you're, you do not have a uh, <clears throat> articulable conflict of interest that would preclude your participation. Okay. Therefore, you are required to participate. Thank you. Let me let me mention something. My apology when we're move, generally in Michigan, if it's a rural community, we look at a rural development 538. I hadn't had a, any time to talk to Mr. Gary about that. It showed up and then I wanted to make that clear tonight so that there wouldn't be any confusion later. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go to those housing studies and I read both of the housing studies, the one that was uh, produced for the city of Sault Ste. Marie, the other one that was produced for uh, Jeff Hagen's group, the EUP uh, Planning and Development. I did talk to Jeff Hagen about those studies. Those studies uh, had specific targeted data that was looking to see if we could actually support market rate apartments and it had absolutely nothing to do with uh, low to moderate income um, housing. Um, even inside the report, there's a disclaimer that says that that data is not even reviewed. So I think we've been kind of leaning on these reports a little bit in the wrong way. They were, uh, had a specific purpose uh, for the city, and, and Justin could maybe back me up, to see if we had a market and what the potential class of people would be to create uh, some market rate apartments downtown. 
Um, the single purpose study was to analyze potential demand for higher end market rate units. Um, it also mentioned in the report that financing for mixed use buildings is often very challenging, which Craig just mentioned, to obtain even times of normal capital flows. And the market for new housing in downtown Sault Ste. Marie is somewhat small in scale. Uh, the market itself, I think, is the responsibility of the developer to determine whether it's feasible and to do uh, due diligence. I would uh, call the commission's attention to the memo that we got with the parameters. And uh, Sault Ste. Marie median income uh, that I looked up today is $32,000. And the area of income uh, to qualify uh, according to the memo, 52% of our city residents live within that income. So median income, half of it is higher and half of it is lower. So we are talking about a much different uh, income level in Sault Ste. Marie as compared to the state of Michigan, which has a $49,000 median income. And that includes the urban areas that have a high homeless and a, uh, homelessness rate. So 49,000 for the state of Michigan, ours is 32,000. So think of all the people that would be eligible to live in this housing. I remember when I graduated from college, came back to get my bank job, and my wife was a student, we would have been about half of uh, the income qualification guideline, and we would have been very happy to live here. You have LSSU students that could live there. We have seniors that can live there. We have a lot of uh, area uh, within the city and people within the city they would enjoy to live in a place like this. I just wanted to uh, say, you know, here we have uh, Woda Group was a private investor. They're bringing outside capital to Sault Ste. Marie. They have an option on the land. They're very serious about this. The land is vacant. It's been sitting there for a long, 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 long time. It's a brownfield site. It had a, a warehouse there. Uh, there has not been a lot of interest in it. I think uh, Justin and, and uh, a group have tried to bring a couple developers up, and uh, we've been unsuccessful so far in trying to market that area. Uh, what is in interested, they're invested a lot of money in feasibility. The engineering, I can't even imagine what they have into that already. And if you could show the uh, rendering, I think that would, would be a nice thing to show to the audience and also to the people watching at home. WOTA has a proven track record. They have other investments in Sault Ste. Marie, so this is the economic gardening concept. They have stuff here. They want to grow here. They want to have more uh, business. This is not a site that would attract a lot of high rents. Uh, you wouldn't see the $2,500 lofts or townhouses there because you'd be overlooking areas that, that would not probably attract that type of person. Um, we, as a city, have been assisting War Memorial and LSSU to bring the Sim Lab downtown, which is college students. We want activity downtown. We want people walking around. We want to build up that base. Uh, this is the same type of base in my mind because it would be the same type of people. It will improve the housing stock in Sault Ste. Marie because as you put higher end, better units on the top, the junk falls off the bottom. And I'm not saying that any of the other ones are junk, but we, we went through this rental program <laughs> argument for a long time. And if you want some of those houses to come off more quickly than we can do with our committees, then you need to add better stock on top of the, um, the heap. We do have some quality market rentals and developers in town. We have uh, McGehee Apartments, we have Harwood Apartments, and they all have very nice apartments. Uh, and they have had the opportunity to build more. Uh, but we haven't seen them building more right now. We did grant pilots to Edge of the Woods, Wood Creek, um, just to name a few, Bridgeview, Avery Center, uh, West Pier, so we have done in the past. A lot of potential tenants, students, self-employed people, seniors, recent graduates, Coast Guard people would probably fit within the criteria. And these will be brand new construction, high quality units, and they're made affordable through the Litex uh, tax credits that Craig mentioned. I just wanted to refer real quickly to uh, some of the things that we just did. And it was our mission statement in 2020 vision for the city of Sault Ste. Marie under economic base. Goal A8, the city will be known for its welcoming and entrepreneurial spirit, which leads to the expansion of good quality businesses within the community. A15, downtown Sault Ste. Marie has success successfully reinvented itself as an area of small shops, restaurants, active farmers market, entertainment, with an increased number of people residing within walking distance from these services. 
and is known as a place where growth and expansion of business opportunities are welcomed. Under social, cultural, and historical issues, the city has implemented a strategy to specifically attract retirees to move to Sault Ste. Marie area by increasing the housing, entertainment, activity, and medical care services and other social and educational opportunities that are appealing to retirees. And under C10, the various residential neighborhoods in the city of Sault Ste. Marie continue to work towards the common improvement of their neighborhood by identifying neighborhood problems, serving as a neighborhood watch, and providing social opportunities to improve the neighborliness of the various residential areas within the city. And then, uh, last but not least, in our 2020 vision, under housing, E1, the city's residents will enjoy living in neighborhoods where reinvestment in Sault Ste. Marie's historic housing stock has created good quality economical housing, has enabled more residents to become homeowners. E4, the city pragmatically enforces housing code violations, including condemnation of structures deemed to be nuisance within the city. As I said, the new housing stock will come on and, and push some of that. The city actively markets publicly owned vacant land for the purpose of redevelopment of housing within the residential areas. The city encourages private development, which expands the number of housing units located within the downtown area. And Sault Ste. Marie houses several new residential subdivisions located in appropriate locations within the city of Sault Ste. Marie. And if I may have just one more minute. Uh, Commissioner Gary? Um, <laughs> sure. I just going to say you, you've done your homework very well. Um, you make a uh, strong argument. And I don't, think the, I don't think the commission is against the development. Um, in, in my case, I would, I would like to see additional market rate units. That doesn't mean um, that I'm against the, the project, but you make a very strong <laughs> argument. You. And under our goals, these are our 2017-2018 city commission goals that we just set. Under economic development, B1, support Lake Superior State University and its students is their paramount importance to the vitality and prosperity of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, and I, I would say that students would probably be a, a market uh, that you'd be looking at. B2 is embrace the concepts of economic gardening to create wealth and growth within the established business community. They're an existing business in Sault Ste. Marie, and they're looking to expand and, and build. Support the redevelopment of the Maloney's Alley vicinity. Embrace a business-friendly approach in every aspect of municipal operations and continue to operate downtown properties and explore options to free up tax at TIPA and continue with the making of visual improvements throughout the entire city. So by our own goals, I think we didn't have anything that was specific to low to moderate income housing, um, but we do have goals for increasing quality of housing. We have goals for increasing uh, the quality of business buildings downtown. Here we have a developer who wants to build nine to a million, nine to eleven million dollar building. I'd still like to see the. Can't get it. Can't get it. Um, <laughs> the rendering. And I, I guess you know, and, and going back to uh, the mayor of uh, of Grand Rapids, and I know they're having mm -hmm. a similar issue with this, but she said uh, they're a community of yes, and uh, that would be something that we should do. And I guess our my question would be: Are we a pro development community? Uh, and we want better ho housing opportunities for 44% of our community. We only have a 56% homeowner rate. 44% of our community are renters. And we want somebody with a proven track record in the industry to invest nine to $11 million in our community downtown. Thank you. The, uh, just a couple of comments. The, um, <laughs> the, the mayor, I did, I, did, I did talk specifically to the mayor of Grand Rapids about this particular, and, and they are wrestling at this point with where those located, where, where those developments will occur in their communities. Um, and we're not, certainly not Grand Rapids and don't have the wherewithal that Grand Rapids has. Um, but ultimately, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's a great project, but um, let's work on the market rate units and let's go to some more commissioners. Let's go to Commissioner Gage over here first. Um, thank you, Mayor, and, and I appreciate Commissioner Gary's comments. I agree with a lot of them. I agree with a lot of Commissioner Twardy's comments and the mayor's comments. Um, I have a couple questions and then just one comment. So the, the questions are, will students be eligible to rent these apartments? Well, well I was going to clarify. I was going to clarify because, um, number one, it has to be a student who is head of household that can qualify. And uh, you can't, we can't load up students in there. So it's a very limited number of students, probably graduate students, that could qualify. We don't, we don't have any of those, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Pardon? <laughs> we don't have any grad programs. At about marriage students, unfortunately. Um, and yep. what's the timeline that these will remain subsidized, and when's the sunset that they can become market rate after they're built? 
Is there a timeline that they can switch from from subsidi or from low income housing to market? Rate? Well, the first we will pledge affordability for forty five years. Okay, so just just a little bit of time then. That's uh, part of the way that you score and you win, and it's part of the way that uh, the Section forty two federal yeah. gurus um, make sure that affordable housing stays. For a long term. Um, so I can tell you that I, I love this project. I think it's amazing. I've seen I've seen firsthand what you've done with the Lloyd in Menominee. I went and toured it. It's an amazing, amazing improvement to downtown Menominee. I personally, speaking as the only person up here that lives in an apartment, wish I could live there. Um, I don't make that much money, but I, I'm just a little bit above it. My wife certainly... Take a is, wage cut. That's what I'll do. Yeah, that, that's what I'll do. Uh, <laughs> University, I love you for it. Great advice, Commissioner. I don't think they can pay lower than minimum, um, can they? <laughs> Let's keep that on the agenda, um, item, please. The, the unfortunate thing is I could qualify with my wages, but, but given that I'm married to my wife and she makes Canadian wages that are insanely good for us, um, we will not qualify. I'm hoping that I can get into the lowest market rates. I really hope so. Um, but I can tell you that that to echo the sentiments, I mean, I don't want to stand in the way of this project. I think it can be a great thing for our community and it can be a great thing for our downtown, but, but working at Lake State like I do, we're constantly importing people into the community to, to become professors or to, to work in the library or whatever. And, and I have to say that, that finding them rentals and finding them places here in this community is very difficult. And constantly I'm going to, to private homeowners that I know that have, are trying to sell their house and trying to negotiate them, just let, this pe let these people rent for three, four months because there's no good market rate housing at all. Um, and I know that that's not part of this discussion at this point, but you know, I, I would really hope if, if, if it's at all possible, I don't want to say in the way of this project, but if it's at all possible in the phase two to have that be 100% market rate, that would be super cool. And I mean, you know, I mean you, I'm sure you can't promise that now, but, but is there any potential that that, that could be a phase two? I mean, well, there's not. There's roughly an acre of land there, and we're going to consume everything. Um, I can't see how there'd be a phase two on that site. I do know that just like Menominee, once we took that blighted area, and we notified that we were going to get credits, that all of a sudden everything around it started to pop. Uh, a I like to tell the story of the entrepreneur that came in. And he took the historic garage across the street, converted it into a call center and a training center. And he's got a bunch of millennials. I think he has 22 student, I mean, young people that are working at a lower wage, but they're in the downtown and they help train L'Oreal and Revlon um, beauty people throughout the world from that site. Then he went across the street and bought another dilapidated building and put another 12 units in. And it kind of has a replicating effect. That whole block has been transformed. And the reason why the governor keeps talking about uh, Lloyd House as the key place-making venue in all the UP and throughout Michigan. When we talked about this initially and looked at that site, knowing that I'm primarily light tech hoping to get seven to ten to more market rates it was wow maybe this would be an opportunity to transform that area within phil and bring some bodies and bring some families visiting and guests visiting that could patronize right. it's not exactly ma'am what you council or commissioner what you would envision because there is always a great desire to put market rate in our downtowns throughout Michigan. But as you mentioned, Mayor, about Grand Rapids and how they're wrestling, what they're wrestling with now is where to strategically place affordable housing. Uh, we have a deal right on the river at the 6th Street Bridge, 68 units. We purposely put it there because the city said, we want affordable away from everything that's concentrated affordable. I don't think we have that situation here where we're concentrating all the affordable in one location. We're down, down toward this area, you know, where, where, and unfortunately my elevation, which I can bring at the next meeting to show the elevation, 
doesn't look affordable. It's a combination of brick and hardy plank and windows that, that look like they belong a flat roof, not a pitched roof that makes it look more residential. It's more to blend in and, and to set, set in motion, hopefully, additional investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lynn, you had a comment. Or yeah, a just, I have a couple of things, but uh, would married uh, college people be able to go into this housing? If you're married and you're going to LSSU, I'm sure you can't afford very good housing. I will have to come back because there's a distinction. If there's a head of household that's earning income that can support the rents that are going in there, uh, but if there are two college students that are married, I am not sure, sir. I'll have to, I'll have to get the answer. Well, the, the thing with me is we do not have enough what they call market rate housing in Sault Ste. Marie. If you want to go to Harwood, you want to go to McGahee's, you are on a waiting list. And they're very, very good housing. And we need it badly. The other thing is we talk about the lock job. And I'm actually getting sick of hearing about the lock job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> will this thing ever happen? But let's say it does happen. Where are these people, these workers, construction workers, they're very well paid and they deserve to be well paid. Where are they going to live in Sault Ste. Marie? Where are you going to live? Where are they going to live? All of a sudden you've got an influx of a lot of workers. Where are they going to go? You've got certain landlords that are going to jack up the price for probably not the greatest apartments, etc. But that's something that we're going to have to face if they ever decide to do the thing. But uh, I really would like, love to have seen the market rate in that area. However, uh, I was wondering if Commissioner Gary could go through that again. My hearing aid was off, <laughs> and, and I'd like to listen to the whole spiel again. But, I'd love to. But I, I thought that uh, it, it was well worth it, and I'm glad he did it. It pointed out some things to me that has changed my mind. Uh, and I even agree with Gage. But, uh, <laughs> stuff. but that kind of investment, you don't see that very often, Sue St. Marie. We better grab it. Mr. Bauer. Yes. Um, I think that we've heard a lot of good points here. There are a couple that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, and first of all, Commissioner Twardy, um, as you say that you know, the low to mod income people aren't out you know, uh, going out for coffee that much. Well, neither are the people who aren't living in the Claremont trucking building. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least, at least if you've got people living there, there's a chance. But if you've got to make it an empty building, there's nobody there that's going to be out buying coffee or beer. That, that's A. Uh, on the other hand, Commissioner Gary, just a couple of things. I don't, I don't know how many Coasties would actually qualify to live here. Um, and not only that, but you also talked about the uh, overlook as far as market uh, rate housing and, you know, maybe not on the second and third floor, but I'll bet the fourth floor, mm -hmm. the overlook is going to be pretty nice uh, looking onto the St. Mary's River and, and Sioux, Ontario. So uh, I would have to and disagree with, yeah, and, and the lock. So I would kind of disagree with you uh, there as well. Um, I, I do agree, though, uh, with the mayor that we do have to be a community of yes, and we do have to welcome uh, development with open arms, uh, absolutely. And we can't sit here and, and pick and choose, you know, that we want you to have X amount of market rate and, and this or that. I mean, we should just be uh, very glad that you're uh, willing to invest in our community. And uh, I think we all feel that way to one degree or another. One question I do have though in regard to parking uh, potentially, and uh, this, is a, this is something that affects me directly, um, the parking that would be back there, I mean, how much of that would remain public parking and how much of that would be for residents and customers of that facility only? But well, I know that there are a lot of people who work for the Corps of Engineers. Can we put the picture back up on, on, a, on a Can we put the picture basis. back up on the screen? Yeah, it's not. Can we, we ever have it? Yes, uh, right, right here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, our parking number of parking spaces. I think we're at sixty-eight to seventy-two somewhere in there, but we we're tight on parking. 
were very tight. And the parking would have to be reserved for residents, otherwise, you know, so. And I know we've talked before about the fact that this is an area where people park, you know, and, and I don't think there's, I, I saw gates, but I don't know if the gates go up and, you know, no. or it's just anybody can park in there. Right. Um, so we would need all the parking. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner? Comment on that, Sorry. though, is that that's going to create a whole new set of problems yeah. back there. Sure. Not just for me, but, and for a lot of other people more than me. Um, that's just a statement. Just, could I, maybe we could fund another parking Mr. garage. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Osterl, you have a comment? <laughs> Evidently, he didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> No, I just want to echo what everybody else is saying. I, I welcome the Wota Group to come in and build this development. <laughs> Would we like to see more, more market rate? Yes, but as Commissioner Gary put out, pointed out, it looks to me like we actually have more need for the, the low to mod income housing. And I would like to uh, make a motion that we approve a first reading of the included ordinance and schedule the consideration of second reading of the included ordinance and adoption of the same for the regular city commission meeting scheduled to take place on March 20th of 2017. Support. Okay, it's been moved, supported, uh, discussion. I'd like to have uh, Justin Nepper, who's our Downtown Development Authority, I think his name's been mentioned. Justin, could you just, how do you feel about, um, you know, the, the project, the, uh, you're, you're in touch with the business community down there. Um, I'm sure you guys have been talking about it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think you probably have a few, <laughs> few, words, a few words that you'd like to say. Um, good evening, Mayor and Commission again. I'm just pulling up my notes that I tried to write. Um, <clears throat> I've been, uh, so I, I came here five or six years ago. Housing, uh, when I first uh, started with the Downtown Development Authority, I didn't fully understand um, just how big of, a, of, uh, of an issue housing is in the downtown. Right now we have about, uh, we have I think uh, just around 100 units in, in specifically on Portage and Ashman combined about 163 downtown residents. So out of 15,000 people, uh, well actually I think the last census was about 13.8, we're down substantially, but about out, out of 13,800 residents, only about one and a half percent live in downtown Sault Ste. Marie. So we're pretty light on bodies. Um, we also have, uh, we just completed our Michigan Main Street application and in order to do that application, we had to calculate the amount of s vacant square footage in upper floors. We have last count over 20,000 square feet. Uh, I have about 50 units uh, in upper floor buildings that are, uh, currently exist that are, that are open and ready for development and all of these are opportunities for market rate units. The, there, there's a few things that I've been thinking about. I, I to be honest, when I first uh, heard about uh, Woda Group's uh, interest in, in building uh, low and moderate income units downtown, I was not very interested. Uh, market rate units are absolutely needed very badly. Uh, I've also spent six years talking to, since I've been here, talking to every single developer that I can find, begging them to do that. And the, 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 the cash flow, the ability to, to, to charge the rent rates needed for new construction projects is very difficult to make those numbers work. Our top end units downtown right now that are market rate are um, Mr. Lambros units on the corner of Water and Ashman, and those I believe around $700 a unit, and then Tom Robinson's units above Austin Zoke, which are around $650 a unit, and those are our nicest units, and those are pretty affordable in terms of what those rent rates are. Um, so I find, uh, I guess I find it something that I've, I've thought about quite a bit in the last month or two is just what the impact would be and, and from a financial standpoint, absolutely uh, uh, payment in lieu of taxes and uh, MSA, all of those things are not you know, the best case scenario for a taxing unit. But on the flip side, uh, as Commissioner Bauer said, it's, it's a lot better than a, a pigeon infested <coughs> cinder block warehouse that hasn't been touched in 40 years. And that's the biggest thing that I've been thinking about is the fact that m Downtown has a tremendous amount of room for development, especially market rate development going forward. We have 
geographic geography downtown and vacant property downtown that is 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 tremendously has tremendous opportunity for when the locks job happens for example uh, all along Portage Avenue there's vacant parking lots uh, going all the way down to Carl's Cuisine uh, of course the Templeton lot next to the Palace restaurant um, a lot of our pocket parks the former bowling alley lot where Pat Cleary owned across from Lynn Auto Parts we have similar acreage and similar size that is directly on the main street even closer and better view of the locks that I think would be the best for market rate units and uh, the thing that I've been thinking about as well I, is more qualitative. I've been calling and talking to a lot of tenants and just trying to figure out the the stories of Avery Square and of Park Place City Center. Uh, I mean, this morning I had a, a young guy. He just got a parking ticket because he didn't know where to park because he just moved into town last this week from Traverse City. He just got his first job at Sukwap Credit Union. He qualified for Park Place City Center. You know, well dressed, sharp young guy. I was actually kind of surprised that that he qualified, but the 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 salary of a starting job uh, in downtown is you know like um, like uh, Craig mentioned, you know you can make up to fifteen seventeen dollars an hour and perhaps perhaps qualify for some of these units. So based on how they manage the properties, I think it would be um, you know that's where the opportunities are. Secondly, I talked to a lot of people and businesses uh, in Menominee. I decided to call the library which is right across the street from the Lloyd House and I asked the librarians that lived there I did whoever answered the phone I said hey when you look out the window and you see the Lloyd House what's happening the last two years are you seeing I mean this sounds maybe I, I I'm not meaning it to be offensive but are you seeing people standing out there you know smoking cigarettes all day or are you or what what kind of um, you know impact are you seeing and and one like the librarian said well I don't have any stories except for the fact that there's a lady that's lived there for two years and she started her own library appreciation day and and every year this young lady that lives in the Lloyd house which is very similar to this project invites all the librarians over to eat lunch and look out the window at the at the marina in the Men in Menominee so I, I thought that it was it kind of caught me by surprise um, and then the other thing and this is this is the trickiest part that I've been thinking about Maloney Alley and the surrounding businesses you have Portage Avenue on on the Main Street or Main Street Portage Avenue is where our tourist district is where our finest hotel is literally one block back which is the parking lot is now um, home to Salvation Army which is working on they're locked in there Salvation Army is working on changing their location of their uh, food bank I believe and of their uh, lunchroom and all those things on Spruce Street and over the next few years that will be their location for all of their services for the community the laundromat is directly behind it the post office the hospital M bank um, and then of course we're surrounded by a number of properties that are still blighted on either side of the of that property I I struggle with whether or not Maloney Alley area and that parking lot specifically has a short-term potential to be anything else and I think that when market rate developers come into town they're going to look at the properties directly on Water Street and directly on Portage Avenue um, and then and then uh, the other thing uh, that really has been sticking out in my mind is just hearing the census data and realizing that we went from 18,000 people in 1960 to 13,800 people in in 2017 and I guess when I heard that number I just thought well we probably have more room for more people of all different income levels and and so that's where I'm at I, I certainly do not know um, you know I don't speak for the DDA board on this uh, we haven't fully talked through all the different issues and many of you on the Commission were on the DDA board and I value your opinions um, I I just am not 100% um, I, I guess I, um, I there's layers on all sides and what we have the control over is how the um, how the incentives work and the and the taxes work and otherwise it's a private property and a private developer and so that's that's my thoughts on it okay thank you thank you Justin I appreciate it uh, Commissioner Torney thank you just a couple more quick comments first of all I want to thank thank Commissioner Gary for his very thorough interpretation and and you're right. I mean, a lot of the stuff is our, our vision and our goal. I still, so no, nobody that works for the Coast Guard will qualify for this housing because there's something called VHA. 
that they uh, they roll into their <coughs> annual salaries, and that's their variable housing allowance, and that would put them way over the edge. So nobody in the Coast Guard would ever qualify for this project. But I think um, I was planning on voting no, not because I'm not in support of WOTA project, because my sister has told me how great the Lloyd project is over in Menominee, and I know there was a huge need there for that, and I know that you guys were full before you even broke ground. So there was a huge need over there for that. But I, I think that what Justin just said made me want to vote yes on this, because as currently, yeah, there is nothing happening there other than a, a silly old warehouse. And I do appreciate the fact that you would come into our community and, and spend millions of dollars. It makes me really angry that the government makes it easier for you to put in low to moderate income than it is for you to put in market rate income. That's what makes me really frustrated. Not the fact that the housing is going to be there, but that it's easier for developers to come in and not make it equal for everybody. Why not 50-50? Why not satisfy a full range of people? But um, that being said, I support your motion. Okay, anyone else? Uh, we have a motion to support on item number one. Um, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Ostrout? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Motion carried. Commissioner Ostrout, number two. Okay. I was also uh, have supported a motion to schedule a public hearing on the included ordinance to be held during the March 20th, 2017 regular meeting of the City Commission prior to consideration of potential adoption of the same. Support. Support. Move support. Are there any questions? <coughs> Roll call, please. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Ostrout? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Motion carried in finding number three. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to schedule a public hearing on the repeal of the Absolute Property Rehab Act incentive for the subject property as detailed for the March 20th, 2017 regular City Commission meeting. That's obsolete. That's obsolete. <laughs> what did I say? Absolute. You're thinking of a vodka. Absolute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> absolute. <laughs> yeah. I stand corrected. Yeah. Obsolete. Yeah. Uh, is there support? It's support. It's support. Yeah. <laughs> Roll call, please. Commissioner Ostrout? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Boss? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. And I know this took a little while. Craig, and appreciate your uh, well, attention you to this. Much, uh, Thank you. Good luck to you. And uh, yeah. going forward, if you can add a few more market rate units, we'd really be happy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Uh, hopefully, you can bring it to fruition. Thanks. Okay. Uh. Next item, uh, number seven, is communications. A, from Denny Doherty, Project Park Activity Update in Voyager Island Park and Sioux Seal Recreation Area. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Denny, for sitting through the hearing <laughs> some information. Come on up. <laughs> you don't qualify. Uh, thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, Oliver asked me to uh, put in a report on the projects we plan to do this uh, coming year. And I listed the ones that we had kind of as a two-year project. And uh, so those are in your report. And also the new ones. And what we'd like to do is add some more boardwalks to the Voyager Island. And we'd like to add a trail that connects the city and school property. So in your report there, I hope you had some time to look at it. If you have any questions to shorten things up, you've been sitting here long enough probably. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions, I'm here for them. Uh, quite, uh, Commissioner Gage. It's just a comment. I want to say, honestly, Denny, I appreciate you coming to the commission, but as far as I'm concerned, you have my support for whatever you do. <laughs> you do an amazing That's job. A, yeah. And, That's the uh, way it's been. I mean, he doesn't ask for much, and he, and he does just a tremendous amount of work with, a, with his, you saw the cadre of people that, uh, and that's probably not all of them. Hopefully, we, you, you mentioned everybody. Um, and I mean, she, he's pretty good about that. So, but that was for that project, and uh, the uh, project park, uh, I mean, the Minneapolis Woods project was really something also. You're a um, tremendous asset to this community. Yes. Thank you. Very Thanks. glad you're in this community. Well, and Marianne. Yeah. As we know, without Marianne, yeah, yeah. you would be standing there. That's, right. that's the other half right there. Thanks so much for everything. Yeah. Yes. Just Mr. on those islands, is there any chance you could put in some market rate apartments? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Hey, Wait a minute. You know, Take a look at the talking view. to you about that. No. Yeah. <laughs> 
go right by, yeah. you know? But, well, we just need the $3 million bridge to get there, and we're good. Okay. Verna Lawrence wanted to build that, if I remember right. That sounds good. Thank you very, thank you very much. Good luck, okay. good luck with your projects. You'll, you'll Thanks do well. a lot for You're your back. support. Yep. Thank you. Okay, item number eight, the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Item A under the city manager's report would provide for the award of a bid for off-site fleet fuel systems for the city of Sault Ste. Marie and Sioux area public schools. On Wednesday, February 22nd, two sealed proposals were received jointly by the city and Sioux schools from Blarney Castle Oil Company and Holiday Station stores for off-site fueling system options. Holiday Station stores <coughs> proposed a fleet card system with costs being based on rack rate less applicable fees as outlined in the specifications. Blarney Castle Oil Company provided a deviation in their cost proposal specifying retail rate with a rebate, therefore not meeting specifications. Based on the proposals received, Holiday Station stores provided the city the best pricing available meeting specifications for both the city and the school. Moreover, Holiday offers a self-managing fleet system software that allows the city and schools to chart fuel, mileage, costs, timing of fuel, location, card security, and various specified accounts to allow us to manage and assure that the fuel being purchased is for appropriate uses. The holiday agreement would allow uh, employees traveling for their holiday gas stations to utilize these cards at those locations for the same reduced cost received for gas in Sault Ste. Marie. In conclusion, the recommendation of the Joint City School Fuel Committee is that the bid be awarded to holiday station stores. Moreover, it's the city's intention to continue maintaining travel fuel cards through Red Express, which will be issued and monitored by the Deputy City Manager's Office to receive gasoline when employees are traveling on city business without ta taxes from which the city is exempt. Accordingly, it's my recommendation, first, that the City Commission award the purchase for off-site fueling to holiday station stores for a five-year period with an additional one-year renewal option, as outlined in the proposal, subject to concurrence by the Sioux Area Schools Board of Education, uh, which was bid as part of a collaboration with the schools, and secondarily, that the City Commission authorize the use of travel fuel cards through Wright Express, which will be issued and monitored by the Deputy City Manager's Office for fuel purchased outside of the holiday station service areas. Okay, thank you. And there are two recommendations, discussion with the City Attorney. Those are two separate motions, uh, Commissioner. On the first one, so move the City Manager's recommendation. Support. Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Osterhoff? Yes. Motion carried. Commissioner Lynn? <coughs> Second one, uh, so move the city manager's recommendation. Support. Support. It's been moved, supported. Any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner mm -hmm. Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Osterhoff? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item B under City Manager's Report would provide for the award of a bid to McGahey Construction for the Polar Community Building Manny Bichet Room Upgrade Project. On this matter, uh, DPW Assistant DPW Director and Parks and Recreation Director Wires is planning to make a brief presentation to the City Commission. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> evening, Dan. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Brief, I've been told. The Fred R. Manny Boucher room, and there's, uh, I wanted to put this up uh, first for the public to see, um, was the City of Sault Ste. Marie Parks and Recreation Director for many years. And this, this room that we've been, uh, this project started, I want to say, at least a year and a half ago, if not longer. And um, UP Engineers has been a partner with the city on this, and we've gone through many variations and thought lines and it incorporated a lot of uh, in input from a lot of our users. So this has come a, come a long ways and I, I wanna make sure that uh, the, the commission and the, and the citizens got to see uh, this photo of Manny Boucher that's in the Manny Boucher room and just to kind of put it in context, this room was dedicated by the commission back in February of 1980. That's 37 years ago. So it's, it's, it's been a while and certainly, um, this project with a lot of fundraising uh, that has been that has taken place uh, this 
improvement. Now I'm going to get to a few slides that are just going to show you a little bit of the improvements. Uh, the project consists of wall demolition, installation of commercial access door, minor electrical work, and associated room finishes per the drawing. And this, um, uh, the big piece that you're going to see, um, and I'm going to show you some photos, is that this thing's going to open up from the Manny Boucher room into the Polar Community Building right into the arena. Scope of the work um, is the base bid, and again, uh, includes demo of existing masonry wall uh, and relocation of existing electrical outlets, and then alternate number one, which is part of this as well, is to include and furnish installation of proposed six-inch LED can lights. There's 14 of them that'll be going in, and also to include demo of an existing office wall. It's an old office that was there, and it's going to be a, 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 a half wall with a mini trophy room. And then alternate number three uh, is something that is going to be done with the, the, the dollars. Uh, the, the budget amount is $39,900, and uh, the bid came in at $55,190, but it came in with all these alternates. So the idea is to, to go with the base bid in alternate number one and two, which would come up with a total of $34,200, and that would leave $5,700 left to complete some finishes, some floor finishes, and also the ceiling as well. And the Boucher family um, dollars, those will be going towards the ceiling and uh, supplies and that uh, for the ceiling as well. And one thing I, I, I do want to mention is that $100 is coming over from the, uh, a, fund, a recent fundraiser, uh, food contest fundraiser, um, and also that Art Dairy from Floor Masters has <coughs> pledged his labor to put in the flooring. This photo, um, basically up above is the entrance uh, from the room into the arena. This is from the, from the Manny Boucher room. And this is where you'll see the wall demolition and the new electrical. And now looking at the photo, obviously you can see Manny's picture up on the wall. Down below you can see the electrical. That electrical is going to be taken right out and take it uh, in context of right below that, you're going to be taking out that wall, and you can see the two beams in the photo. There's two of the beams in the photo. Take yourself down to the, to the con, uh, construction drawing. You'll see the three beams. There's a third beam towards the office, but uh, right about where Manny Boucher's uh, picture is is where the second door, uh, second door from the left uh, below is where that's going to be, right below that window, almost, you know, maybe almost right in the middle of the door. So it's going to be taking that whole wall, cutting it out, going into the arena. And you'll be able to see that the, where you see the light, you see the tiles, that's all going to get replaced as well. But those beams will all stay in place. Uh, and then uh, the demolition of the existing office wall uh, that's directly ahead um, in that photo right in the center. And that's an addition of the 14 LED lights. The installation of the half wall for the mini trophy display room, new flooring, ceiling tile structures with tiles, and in the drawing below, which you'll be able to see, uh, looking towards the upper left corner, you'll see where the stairs are, and that uh, in that top corner is where you'll see um, where they're going to put in the half wall and take that office out, and so it kind of gives a little perspective of of what uh, we're looking at. And that office was added many years ago. So this is kind of, kind of taking the room back to its original roots and then opening that up for the public and putting some items in there. Now this is a, a view from Center Ice uh, looking at the, um, the ADA area and also the press box and also the media deck, which is above the ADA area and below the press box. And you'll be able to see that on the picture on the right. And that's where you get Arf Arfstrom Pharmacy is one of our sponsors there, and they're the ones who sponsor that deck. And you kind of take that photo uh, on the right and then go directly down, and you'll be able to see what that's going to look like. There's, you can see the glass there, um, and you, uh, Arfstrom Pharmacy will be uh, still there, and it'll be above the AD area, ADA area, but then you'll be able to see the windows behind it where that's going to open up right onto the media deck area. One of the items that's, that was um, one of the addendums that we're uh, not uh, looking at approving at this point is the alternate media viewing deck, and that's shown on the, 
on the drawing on the bottom drawing on the left hand side and also if you were to take a look at the picture in the upper left hand corner you could see where if that alternate media viewing deck was to be installed it would be installed up towards um, the top left of the ADA area but that is something that we're going to be holding off on at this point so it kind of gives you a perspective of what what we're really doing with the Manny Boucher room and the Boucher family has been very instrumental in this project and concept is to take the 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 Fred Manny Boucher room and and give it a, a very nice um, upgrade and certainly it's going to open up and give the city give the puller some opportunities and you know for instance and I'll, I'll, I'll put this out as an uh, as a thought even with our junior a team the Sioux Eagles that are in that building and you know, give them an opportunity or uh, anyone else who's got an event in that building it could be the Shrine Circus that that room can be opened up where you could have say the junior a Eagles could have parents there they could have recruits there they could be doing all kinds of different things there certainly have a hospitality room that can open up into the media deck area so there's a, there's a lot of options there's a lot of things that are possible there and I think it's a, a fitting tribute to a man who was a longtime parks and recreation director here and very very well respected and uh, a lot of people uh, re deserve a lot of credit I know a uh, family member Mike Boucher has been a big yeah just let me behind include, this. Uh, you know, Manny, Manny uh, was a Native American in the Sioux tribe with uh, his son Mike uh, Mike Boucher uh, uh, was able to garner um, additional funding from the Sioux tribe to put that together for the most part and they, the family really wanted the Manny Boucher uh, room uh, used as extensively as possible and if you looked at those pictures uh, it really opens it up from the from the stands too so that uh, no use by the public uh, anyone using the facility will certainly it'll be um, I think uh, there'll be a system on how that room would be used type of thing but uh, it certainly will be available and a lot of credit goes to the the family members that went out and, and got the additional money to make that happen so uh, Commissioner Torney thank you yeah just a couple of comments so uh, there was a, a young man who played for the Sioux Eagles last year who uh, plays for Ferris State now and he was here over the weekend playing the Lakers and he got to go into the polar and, and see coach Bruno and he couldn't get over how awesome it looks in there and he was really really excited he said you know I would have loved to have played in this building not that he didn't play in an awesome building but and kudos to the fundraising committee and I, I know that Commissioner Lynn is on that committee and you continue to bring in money and yes thank you for the tribe I, I think this is going to be a valuable asset to the to the building it's it's gonna make the building look even better and it's I think it's great that the whole thing is funded by what you've been fundraising so. Would you like to make the motion? Sure, I would love to make the motion. I will make the motion to award the Polar Community Manny Bouchure Room, Bouchure, don't mess up that name, <laughs> Boucher Room Upgrade Project to McGahee Construction LLC of Sault Ste. Marie in the amount of $34,200 for the detailed work as presented as they were the low bidder meeting all specs. Support. Support. It's been moved, supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Bauer. Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Ostrow? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item C under City Manager's report would provide for the approval of an agreement with the Acumed Group for EMS billing. On this matter, uh, Chief Labani is planning to present to the City Commission. Okay. Evening, Scott. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. I'll try and be as brief as I can. <laughs> uh, first, a little background. Um, prior to 2012, uh, the city utilized War Memorial Hospital for all of its EMS billing. In return, uh, the city ambulance would provide out-of-town transfers uh, for the hospital. Uh, the hospital's billing department would then uh, do a portion of the EMS billing. Over a short period of time, um, the hospital became less interested in conducting our ambulance billing. 
partially due to the amount of runs we were going on, but also due to uh, compliance with Medicare and Medicaid. It was becoming more strict and there was more compliance standards in effect and, and they just really weren't interested in, in going through the training that was required. So uh, they actually agreed to help us at the time uh, look for uh, a new company or uh, look for a new means uh, to uh, go out for, um, you know, looking for a, a billing company. Uh, through a very strenuous process then done by Chief Thorpe, um, uh, a company was found, uh, and that would be the Acumet Group, and, and uh, the city did enter into an agreement with them in 2012. Uh, the reason the, the Acumet Group was chosen, uh, many reasons, uh, let me pull up some notes here real quick. Um, first, they were a single source provider. Uh, they're a Michigan-based company. They have exemplary, uh, an exemplary service record in compliance with Medicare and Medicaid. They, they have an, extens an extensive history with uh, municipally run ambulance agencies in various sizes from, say, Detroit EMS all the way to Newberry EMS. Uh, and their fees are competitive, competitive uh, with comparable companies. Um, also in doing so, uh, in, in entering, before they entered into the agreement, uh, there was a, a case study done where um, a, a number of ambulance runs were compared to with our, our, our then billing status or our billing protocol uh, with what Acumed recovered. And uh, it was found that there was a, a number of compliance issues and whatnot, uh, and actually found that Acumed was able to, to do a, a uh, how should I put this, an exemplary job recovering uh, those, those billing numbers. Um, to fast forward uh, years later, um, basically uh, over the past five years there was, there was a three-year three agreement as well as a two-year extension. Over that time we've been billed uh, in the agreement for a 6.85 fee as well as a, a uh, proprietary ESO fee and that basically had to do with a software agreement. <coughs> One thing that that the Acumed group and ESO provides is a very comprehensive software package and what this allows uh, our Sioux Ambulance to do is to very well document all of our EMS runs. Uh, as you know already it's extremely important for our paramedics to record all the events that occur on ambulance runs uh, not only for billing purposes, but more importantly, so that we can convey all the information that's needed uh, to the receiving facility. And what's nice uh, with, the, with these software packages is that they're not just run of the mill. We're not just using uh, the, the bare minimum software packages. These are software packages that are up to date with current science and they're continually changing, uh, allowing our paramedics to to uh, completely um, assess people with strokes and heart attacks. So we're right on the level of science. <clears throat> um, so after five years of continuous service from the Acumed Group, uh, a newly drafted agreement has been proposed where the annual billing fee has been dropped to 6% versus 6.85%. Uh, and the annual proprietary ESO fee has been completely eliminated. If this newly drafted agreement is accepted by the city, there would be a significant and immediate savings over the next five years or the life of the agreement as shown in the graph in your packet. The positive economic impact of renewing the agreement with the Acumed Group for EMS billing appears to be obvious. Uh, between the annual savings by way of the eliminated ESO fee of 3742.65, coupled with the reduced fee percentage of 6%, equals to a projected annual savings of $7,594.21. Uh, using a comparable annual recovery from 2015, and I used 2015 because that was the last year where we have all of our recovery was, was taken care of. Even 2016 hasn't been fully recovered yet. Uh, one could further project a total savings of $56,684.30 by the end of this five-year agreement. So obviously a, a very significant savings. 
Um, there are mul multiple companies that advertise uh, to do these ambul ambulance billing. However, there's only a very small handful who are considered to be a single source provider, meaning they offer very comprehensive ambulance billing uh, that, that fall within the, the strict standards of uh, Medicare and Medicaid compliance. Um, that also provide the EMS reporting software, that also provide collections. Um, so that's, that's a, a big point uh, to be looked at. Uh, and also 6% also appears to be at or below average uh, for fees associated with services in this agreement. Um, so as depicted in the account performance graph that, that has also been given to you, um, over the last three years and 11 months, there has been a slight decline in ambulance runs by an average of 9.6% over each year. And this can be attributed uh, to fewer patients uh, requiring regular or frequent transports to and or from daily appointments such as dialysis. Despite a decline, it should be noted that the average recovery uh, per run has been on a steady rise, uh, as noted in the table, under average recovery run. Um, and it's been on a, a rise as much as 14%. So even though we're declining in runs, we're actually rising in recovery. So that's a great thing. Uh, the rise in average recovery runs uh, uh, is attributed to a, a, a streamlined process that I highly attribute uh, to Chief Thorpe's, under Chief Thorpe's direction. Um, if agreed upon, this agreement will go into effect on September 1st, 2017. And uh, I just want to note that it's been favorably reviewed by uh, Attorney Canelo. As far as the financial impact, by agreeing, agreeing to this proposed agreement, the financial impact on the city would amount to a projected annual revised fee of $53,606.13 based, based on 2015 ambulance run numbers. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Gary. I uh, remember when we first discussed this, uh, the company and we signed on with them, they had found some uh, uh, billing adjustments that we could be made in our, our, our favor um, right away, I think it was yep. within mm -hmm. weeks. And I'd just yeah. like to say a very nice job on your first official presentation <laughs> yeah. to the City Commission. Thank Chief. you very much. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, make a motion to approve the renewal agreement with Acumet Group. As I'll presented. support that. Uh, City Manager, anything in addition? Uh, nothing further. As the chief mentioned, the, uh, while there are a number of companies that do provide these various services, uh, Acumed uh, offers a very specialized array of services uh, that few companies can match. I appreciate the work that the chief did to make sure that the fees are comparable to those uh, charged by other companies for mm -hmm. perhaps a lesser service. And I uh, certainly agree that the chief has done a great job hitting the ground running. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, we have a motion to support. Uh, roll call, please. <coughs> Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Osterhaus? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Mayor Bosmus? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item D, under City Manager's report, would provide for the authorization to apply for Michigan Department of Natural Resources Waterways Grant funding for the George Kent Marina repairs. As the City Commission is aware, City Administration has been reviewing a repair project at the George Kent Marina to reskin or refurbish the entire main service pier and three finger piers. These areas are missing the bottom steel skin which exposes flotation billets to damage from ice and animals. The Michigan Waterways Grant Program offers assistance for such projects and historically has provided grant funding on a 50-50 basis. The Michigan water Waterways did provide emergency funding to the city in the past to repair an underground fuel storage tank that had been leaking at the site. The application deadline is April 1st and the repair project is estimated to cost approximately $65,000. It is currently scheduled for fiscal year 2018 to 19 and is projected that if a grant were received, it would cover 50% or $32,500 of the total project cost. Accordingly, it's my recommendation that the City Commission authorize the submission of a Michigan Waterways Grant Program application in the amount of $32,500 <coughs> for funding for this project. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Osterell. Yes, I so uh, move that we support the city commission or the city manager's recommendation. Support. It's been moved support. Are there any questions? We'll roll call, please. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Commissioner Lynn. Yes. Commissioner Ostrom. Yes. Commissioner Twardy. Yes. Mayor Bosmus. Yes. Commissioner Bauer. Yes. Commissioner Gage. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. 
That concludes the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay. Thank thank you. Did you have something uh, under that report that you were going to mention? With oh, me? yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. There is one other item, and that is uh, City Engineer Basista was informed today that the city's grant application for safety funds uh, was approved for uh, the roundabout business spur project. Uh, that grant amount will be 284000 just over $284,000, and that will help defray a significant portion of the $500,000 contribution uh, that, that the city's money. been saving up for. Right. So okay. certainly appreciate Engineer yeah. bringing that to our attention, as uh, typically she does. That helps. Yeah. Excellent. And that's still on schedule for 2018. Yippee. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Okay, item number nine is a status report. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Item A under status report is an update regarding a change in city polling locations effective with the May 2nd election. Uh, just a reminder that if you previously voted at Washington School, you will now be voting at the Business Accelerator Smart Zone building located at 2345 Meridian Street. And if you previously voted at Lincoln School, you will now be voting at St. Joseph Church located at 1101 Minneapolis Street. Uh, if you have any questions, please access our city website or call the city clerk's office. And just a note that if you vote at the Presbyterian Church, you will still vote there. Um, just a reminder, if you vote at the Presbyterian Church, you'll still vote there. And if you vote at Lincoln, you'll now be voting at St. Joseph Church on Minneapolis Street. And if you vote at Washington, you'll be moved over to the uh, Smart Zone Breeder Building at 2345 Meridian Street. Thank you. And then also voter registration cards for those locations have gone out to those individual so they, they should be notified and pay attention to that, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gage. I just wanted to restate my unhappiness with the, the necessity to move polling yeah. locations. Noted. Don't like Thank it. You. Item number 10, matters presented by the public. Is anyone in the audience like to make a comment at this time? Justin? Oh, we got something coming up, I understand. Yes. An activity. I'll be very quick. Uh, Thursday night, Thursday night, 7 o'clock, we will be on uh, the 100 block of Ashman Street, the Little Hill, from between Island Books and Crafts and 1668 Winery down to Water Street. We're going to be dumping, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 dump truckloads of snow on the street. Uh, big thank you to Jim Morrow and Billy Anderson from the Department of Public Works. They're going to be uh, working with us on moving snow for uh, a night. And uh, we're bringing Searchmont Ski Resort over from Canada. They will be uh, bringing over volunteers as well as pieces from their terrain park at Searchmont Ski Resort. We're going to be building our first ever snowboard and ski rail jam. Uh, it's about 300 feet long. Uh, we already have, I think, 70 people signed up on wow. Facebook that they're coming. Um, so come out at 7 o'clock. You can enjoy um, all sorts of activities. We'll have an MC. We'll have music. We'll have judges, prizes food, drink, the whole works. Uh, so again, 7 o'clock, March 9th, um, Searchmont and downtown partnering on uh, skiing and snowboarding. And the word, how's the word getting out besides there? We, uh, we have, uh, we're actually <coughs> sponsored with uh, Eagle Radio 95.1, so they did a big advertising package with us uh, to sponsor the event. Facebook, uh, flyers, it is okay. pretty last minute. We had uh, one of the craziest winters of events that I've been a part of uh, with I-500, Ice Festival, Outhouse Races, Pub Crawl, um, and there's two more I can't remember, and then this. So we've been packing them in, but uh, come out. It'll be Sounds fun. like a lot of fun for a lot of young people. I think <laughs> younger people, Lynn. I put it that way. <laughs> I would okay. think the Commissioner Lynn should do should be a participant. Yeah. Anyone else? Do great. Yes, Chief. Thank you. One more minute. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody about the fourth annual Battle of the Badges yes. coming up on March 18th at Polar Stadium, 4 o'clock. Uh, this year, we'll be playing the police officers at Sault Ste. Marie uh, to benefit the Sioux Area Schools Pantries. Uh, we'll be accepting monetary donations at the game, uh, as well as uh, clean clothes or new clothes, uh, especially uh, coats and hats and boots. Uh, we're going to be trying to fill up a, a pickup truck there, uh, as well as chuck a puck and 50-50 raffles and all that good, happy, fun stuff. So March 18th, 4 o'clock, Polar Stadium, lots of fun. That's Thank a you. Saturday, right? That is a Saturday. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you.
Oh, here comes uh, Dan Wires has something. No. <laughs> Who's the staff? Uh, <laughs> is this one of these meetings? <laughs> yes. Mayor and Commission, just to su support our facility, um, I just want to mention that this weekend is a little bit of a transformation. We have a, an, an NOJHL playoff game on Friday night, and then the Hiawatha Skating Club's annual show will be on Saturday. So we have a big, big event, big weekend at the Polar. So just so that people know, Hiawatha Skating Show is this Saturday. Okay, the Eagles what start? The Eagles start the playoffs. As Eagles third, start the playoffs the and have a play, play in game Friday Ole night. Uh, Friday night. Friday night against Elliott Lake. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> we already said thank you for getting that grant. I had to do it. Thank you for That's the great. applause. Yeah. yeah. And Linda. <laughs> Just like you're right. Unless, uh, Commissioner, uh, no, you're, you're not in Rotary anymore. But are you going to remind about the uh, Graver auction Graver this auction. Saturday here, City Commission Chambers, and then watch on. TV and radio this Saturday. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right you here. Right here. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Item number uh, eleven. Uh, matters presented by the City Commission. Commissioner Twardy. Well, since the staff stole every single one of my comments, uh, the only Good. thing Good. Then I we're moving on. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only thing, and I'll toss it over to you because sure. this is more of a mayoral comment, but a uh, week from Sunday, or next Sunday, is um, a spring forward day for the time being until the state oh. legislature <laughs> changes that. So. <laughs> yeah, we just let the people uh, miss church. You know, <laughs> we don't remind them. Uh, but, yeah, is it two weeks, 18th? No, it's that's next this, Sunday. It's this week, yeah. right? This okay. Uh, turn your clocks ahead, I guess. That's what we want to make sure you know. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> Commissioner Lynn, what happened? Oh, <laughs> Is that, you mean that's it? We we're here. <laughs> Any other department heads want to yeah. say anything? <laughs> okay. Move to adjourn. Sport. Sport. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>